From mini golf to Shetland ponies to the little shampoos that you get in hotels, mini things are generally brilliant. So why then are mini games regularly so rubbish? And these nuggets of non-standard gameplay tucked away inside our video games are never so aggravating as when they're an obstacle planted right in your path to progression, and you're not going to be able to complete the story without messing with this malformed minigame. A Shetland Pony would never do that to us. If anything, it would help us along our path to progression, like the very opposite of these seven unavoidable minigames that made us want to eat our own hands. Final Fantasy VII on the PlayStation 1 will take you around 40 hours to complete if you ignore side missions and spend a reasonable amount of time singing along to the victory fanfare. So it's saying something that of those many, many hours, a single five minute section within that game managed to prove so famously annoying as to earn its way onto this list. But that was the fate that Square Enix brought upon itself when in the late 90s it made the choice to add a snowboarding minigame of all things to its otherwise very fine and respectable turn-based RPG. The snowboarding minigame awaits players at the top of Icicle Inn, a snowy resort town that Cloud and the gang need to make a quick escape from, partly because it's freezing and I mean Cloud has no sleeves, and partly because they're being tracked by the sinister Shinra and Elena, one of Shinra's newest elite operatives. And we use the word elite quite loosely. To get out of Icicle Inn and advance the plot, the player needs to take a child's snowboard and ride it down the mountain, in a minigame as difficult to control as it is absolutely mandatory. Despite controls that purportedly let you steer, jump, brake and even edge the board for faster turns, avoiding the sides of this slippery slope is almost impossible. So rather than carving your way through this minigame like a radical super soldier, it's far more likely you'll spend a miserable few minutes gracelessly pinging off what is a frankly sarcastic amount of obstacles. The track is also littered with balloons that are extremely hard to grab, but don't sweat it too much because bizarrely they do absolutely nothing, except let you practice for the three more snowboarding courses that unlock at the Gold Saucer Amusement Park after you complete this minigame, so you can enjoy Final Fantasy VII snowboarding as many times as you like. I like zero times. <laughs> Talk about near-death experience. Ashley, get out of there! Go ahead, son. Go ahead. Ask a Resident Evil fan who their favourite character in the series is and you'll get a bunch of conflicting answers. Ask them who their least favourite character is though. Ashley from Resident Evil 4. Yeah, it's Ashley from Resident Evil 4. As such, Resident Evil 4 is already pushing its luck at this point during the game where you stop playing as Leon, the boy band handsome human suplex machine who has great at everything and whose hobbies include badass one-liners and knife fights, and start playing as Ashley, whose hobbies include getting kidnapped and no second thing. Damn it. Ashley! What follows though should permanently disqualify Resident Evil 4 from all those best game of all time lists that it's currently sitting on, because it's at this point that Resident Evil 4 decides that you and Ashley are going to do a sliding tile minigame. And guess what friends, it's mandatory. Sliding tile puzzles for the blissfully uninitiated are a unique kind of puzzle that require you to slide tiles around a restricted board until you manage to get them all in the right position to form a picture. The solution to these puzzles, as anyone who's tried one in real life can tell you, is to prise all the tiles out with a screwdriver, place them all back in the right place, and then put it in a drawer and never look at it again. Sadly, this isn't possible in Resident Evil 4, and as such, if you want to get back to the fun part of the game where you're playing as Leon shooting zombies and roundhouse kicking monks, you're going to actually have to sit here and complete this thing, regardless of how long it takes. It isn't even the fun, colourful picture you're trying to put together. It's a low-res beige crest made up of confusing shapes, and only once you've fully completed it and slotted in the final piece does the door that literally contains the rest of the game open, granting you your freedom and reuniting you with lovely Leon. You did good. See? He's even good at lying. Man, Leon rules.
Like frosted tips and low-rise jeans, dead to right seemed like a good idea at the time, which is to say, in the early noughties. I had plenty of work ahead of me. Solve my father's murder and find the guy who set me up. And to do that, I was gonna need guns and information, more or less in that order. This action game, released in 2002, starred your boy Jack Slate, a hard-boiled hero cop who enjoyed doing deadpan narration and diving in slow motion as much as Max Payne enjoyed doing also both of those things. <laughs> But Jack Slate had one thing Max Payne never had. One thing that really set him apart. One thing you could always rely on. That's right, terrible minigames. Wait, I mean, a cool dog. Okay, he had two things. The most memorable of Dead to Right's repeated minigames was the one in which you had to disarm bombs. All right, Shadow, time to earn your stripes. Sniff out those bombs for me. This is a worthy activity, you thought, deserving of the time and attention of a noble game protagonist, even one who could be elsewhere diving around in slow motion. You thought that, right up until you tracked down a bomb with the incredible sniffing powers of your canine colleague and were met with the bomb disarming minigame. a boy. Let me at this thing. At this point, the action goes off the boil so you can attempt to steer the bomb's detonator pin along a zigzagging path around a cylindrical core before the time runs out, in a non-standard gameplay activity that was as annoying as it was unforgiving. I've seen Hurt Locker, I don't think disarming bombs is as fiddly as this. At this point you reversed your stance on whether defusing bombs was a good use of your time, although pointlessly because saving the good people and buildings of Grant City from a series of increasingly frustrating briefcase bombs is of course an obligatory activity. There! Can we please get back to bullet time now? There are several skills you need to be a top lawyer in the Ace Attorney games. Shouting is one. Objection! Banging the desk with your fists, also important. And if you're a prosecutor, dressing like a fashionable vampire is considered a plus. Occasionally though, characters in the Ace Attorney games acquire accessories that let them do their job more effectively, like Phoenix Wright's magic necklace that lets him read people's thoughts. In theory, these are nice little additions to mix up the gameplay of listening to testimony and then yelling at people about their testimony. Hold it! In practice, though, it leads to things such as the Perceive minigame, as seen in Apollo Justice Ace Attorney. Thanks to a bracelet that Apollo wears, which is made of a special alloy that changes size in reaction to body heat and that can sense tension in other people, and which reacts to said tension with minor contractions that Thanks to a magic bracelet, Apollo can sense when someone is nervous. Activating your bracelet sends you into the Perceive minigame, where everything goes into slow motion and you have to scrutinise the witness's behaviour and body language to try and identify a tell that will reveal that they're lying. Gotcha! At this point, Apollo will scream, Gotcha! And then someone will go to prison because they were fiddling nervously with their wedding ring. Gotcha! Which sounds good, in theory. In practice, the tell only appears for a short period of time. And so what this minigame becomes is you hovering over a particular body part while the testimony chugs on in the background at a snail's pace. You then wait for the whole thing to play out and then repeat it while focusing on a new body part over and over until you notice someone's eye twitch. Gotcha! And this isn't a rare occurrence. These perceived sequences happen in almost every case, and you cannot continue the game without the evidence you get from them, which, it should be pointed out, is absolutely not permissible in a court of law. Gotcha! But then again, neither is having a magician as an assistant or the prosecution playing air guitar, so I guess this is all fine. <laughs> Rampley's gonna walk in here and put a mint on some horse running in the fifth. We don't care about Rampley so much as we want his boss. He's the one we're gonna put away for fixing the race. You're hoping Rampley will lead us to him? Bingo. 
In the world of L.A. Noir, police work takes many forms. Yelling at people. Answer the question, Jack. Shouting at people. Shut your f mouth. And of course, flamethrower. Then there is the actual meat and potatoes of gathering evidence, which includes interrogations, investigating crime scenes, and, to our considerable regret, tailing people to see what suspicious places they go to. Wait till he hands over the cash, then tail him. Good luck. I say considerable regret because tailing people is something that Rockstar decided would make for a compelling gameplay sequence, and as such, there is a tailing minigame in L.A. Noir. And it's exactly as bad as you'd imagine it would be. Unlike other games with tailing sequences like Assassin's Creed, Detective Cole Phelps isn't going to be acrobatically parkouring up onto the rooftops to make this whole thing bearable or interesting in any way. And so what follows is you very slowly walking down a street behind someone, occasionally standing behind a post box or looking in a shop window to make it look like you're not following them because you're a master of deception. Sadly, it's clear that tailing suspects on foot is such a core pillar of 1940s police work that there are several cases that it is impossible to complete without having to subject yourself to this snooze fest, where looking interestedly into the windows of electronic stores is considered a legitimate gameplay mechanic. Oh look, yeah, they got the new Baker light. Nice. Because this minigame is so boring, you might find yourself trying different techniques to speed things up, like waiting, then jogging up to your suspect, to try and minimise the amount of time you have to spend walking slowly. To which I would say, good luck! I hope you like looking at this screen. And then having to redo the entire thing. Wait until he hands over the cash, then tail him. Good luck. Man, I hope there's some yelling coming up soon because I am ready. Or flamethrower. Yakuza 0 is so full of weird, wacky, and wonderful mini-games that you wonder if the developers thought you might somehow get bored of the actual game, in which, I remind you, you have a shirtless sewer fight with a pipe-wielding motorbike man. <laughs> In fact, Yakuza 0 appears to have such little faith in its core gameplay that about halfway through the game it fully switches into being a nightclub management simulator whether you want it to or not. Spoiler alert, it's probably not. Due to story reasons, one of the characters you play as in Yakuza 0, the unhinged hitman Majima Goro, ends up being appointed as the manager of a cabaret club, an entertainment establishment where businessmen come to buy expensive drinks and chat to the bar's various hostesses. <laughs> Rather than just telling you that this is the case, however, Yakuza 0 then proceeds to not let you play the rest of the game until you do at least one full night's work as the actual manager of this cabaret club with a completely different gameplay style, set of mechanics, and user interface. Bad luck if you wanted to run off and have more exciting Yakuza fights because you run this nightclub now. Sorry about it. That said, the level of detail involved is astonishingly exhaustive. You have to set the staff rotor to determine who is working, assign training and development courses to improve your employees' skills, and micromanage customer happiness levels once the club is open to make sure everyone is spending as much money as they could be. You can even give the hostesses makeovers, changing their clothes, accessories and hairstyles to improve their earning power. None of which I want to be doing in this organised crime beat-em-up that I bought, Sega. Remember when I fought that motorbike man? That was good. Alright, well at least I don't have to deal with any of this while playing as the other protagonist, Kiryu. No, instead, he's got an equally involved, also compulsory minigame in which you start a real estate business and then prudently manage your property portfolio through wise investments and savvy purchases. A Sega forcing you to make exciting punching games against your will, Yakuza developers. Blink once for yes. In a thousand years, future generations will remember the greatest challenges of our era as being one, climate change, and two, making a hacking minigame that doesn't suck. From their utopian vantage point, where humanity has presumably pulled together to sort out the climate and then develop a really fun minigame where you pretend to hack stuff, nearly every single hacking minigame of the early 20th century will look like ancient hot garbage, but none more so than the hacking minigame in Cyberpunk 2077.
Known as Breach Protocol, this minigame simulates you, a cybernetically enhanced mercenary fluent in all manner of machine code, skillfully overriding a computer system in a race against time to, for instance, steal burritos from a vending machine. Which would be cool and fine in practice if it didn't feel more like playing an inscrutable variant of future Sudoku on a bingo card of alphanumeric nonsense, with rules never adequately explained and presentation that failed to deliver the fantasy of being an unstoppably powerful netrunner. Although to be fair, I didn't pay a penny for those burritos. <laughs> You could try swerving the Breach Protocol minigame as much as possible, but given the ubiquity of hackable things and people and the useful benefits, it's more likely your cyberpunk experience was regularly punctuated by short bursts of a minigame that felt like spreadsheet management as much as cyber breaching the corpo net. If you're watching from the distant future where rubbish hacking minigames are no longer a thing but YouTube somehow is, then God how we envy you! Also, nice work fixing the climate. Let us know in the comments how you did it. Thanks so much for watching this video about mini games that were compulsory and bad, and yet you still had to play them because of the compulsory part, and you didn't enjoy it because of the bad part. Here's a fun mini game for you. Click as fast as you can on one of these two videos, uh, and the reward you will get is continuing onwards in the game, by which I mean uh, your YouTube watching session. So yeah, click on this or that, it's the same, uh, enjoyment from either, they're both good, and thanks for watching. We'll see you next time. Click fast, go!